-hmm. Okay, let's be, let, let's begin. Uh, welcome everyone to the Okayama University Japan Times SDG Virtual of Global Circuit Academic Seminar organized by the Institute of Global Human Resource Development. I am Dr. Nobuyuki Kambara, a professor and vice director of the Institute, and I will be your host today. Tonight is the first night in our series of webinars. Each webinar covers a topic related to Japanese culture or the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and sometimes both. There will be a broad range of topics, which we hope will appeal to a wide range of audience and generate new ways of thinking and discussion. Since we are holding our webinar online, there is a possibility of technical difficulties. I hope that there will be not be any. However, if there are, we will do our best to resolve them quickly. We appreciate your understanding. Tonight's presentation is called A Farm Story, how our small scale organic vegetable farm plays a role in supporting the UN SDGs. Our presenters, Ava Richardson and Zenryu Owatari, will tell us how they got started with organic farming in Japan and will explain the methods they use and reason the reasons for using them. We have included a time for these uh, questions at the end of the presentation. We hope that you will ask many questions in order to generate a good discussion. To ask your questions, please use the chat function in Zoom. Please be aware of that there is also a function called Q&A. However, please don't use that because we will only be checking chat. At this time, I will turn it over to Eva Richardson and send you over Thank you very much, Kamara-sensei. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So welcome to everybody um, who is joining us. Um, and uh, we're really happy to be here. We're a little nervous because it's the first, uh, first session, <laughs> first webinar. Um, and we're up in the mountains in Kyoto. It's very cold up here <laughs> where we are. Um, so this, we're in our home at our farm um, up in Kyoto. And like Kambara Sensei said, please open the chat function and make sure you can add questions at any point during the presentation. And uh, we'll try to answer the questions either during or at the end of our presentation. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we hope you enjoy our story. Okay. Okay, I'm going to share my screen now. So please just give me a moment. Just a moment, please. I'm uh, adjusting the size. There we go. Okay, Kambara Sensei, can you see the full slide? Yes, we can. I can. Okay, great. Okay, so I think we'll get started. So, um, my name is Ava Richardson. And, and my name is Zenryu Owatari. <laughs> and we are the owners and operators of Hello Farm Organics, um, like I said, in Kyoto. And today, uh, our main focus, like Kambara Sensei said, is we were asked to think about how our practice as farmers can connect with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, all right, let's move on here. So um, a little bit about who we are uh, before we launch into uh, the farm. Uh, I'm Canadian, 
And uh, Zendu is, of course. No, yeah, I'm Japanese, native, <laughs> native Japanese. Yeah, and then, yeah, please introduce this. Yeah, um, so uh, yeah. I um, was a farmer in Canada before I came to Japan for seven years, but I'm also um, a certified uh, teacher, elementary school teacher. So I currently, um, for the last 12 years in Japan, I've been teaching at international schools, but we've also been farming for the past uh, 10, is that right? 10 yes, years 10 now? Yes, together. Uh, yeah. Together here, which I wasn't expecting when I came to Japan, but here we are farming. Mm. <laughs> How about you, Zendi? Yes, uh, I'm Buddhist monk also, and I, I've been practicing the Zen meditation in a monastic temple in Los Angeles, United States. And, and moved, moved, moved back to Japan, yeah, 2006, around that time. And whole life, actually whole life, I'm growing the vegetables. Yeah, I'm really interested in growing the vegetables. And also in the temple, uh, we grow the own vegetable and we cook together. And uh, we started farm in Ibaraki prefecture in Japan. Actually, no, I started. I, I started the professionally uh, the organic farming. But after the earthquake, big earthquake, and Fukushima nuclear disaster, uh, we worry about radiation. And we evacuated to Kyoto and started our farm. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, ten years ago, two thousand eleven. And the past big purpose for starting was grow safe and he healthy food for ourselves and for others. Mm. So we want to produce uh, good healthy safe vegetable for, for others. Yeah, which leads well into uh, what our mm. goals are. Mm. So our first, uh, can you go to the next one? I can see. Our first uh, goal uh, and philosophy is to eat safe and healthy food. It's really a simple concept for us. We, especially after Fukushima, we just couldn't know what was safe to eat um, because of the radiation. And so we were really motivated to grow our own food and then extend that out to the customer, to the community. So our second goal is to provide our customers with safe and healthy food. Okay. Um, and then another philosophy, our goal of ours is to live in harmony with the environment by nurturing biodiversity in the soil and in our garden. Now this keyword biodiversity, it really means an abundance of life, lots of diverse living life forms, not only in the garden, but in the soil and all around us. And uh, we'll, we'll talk more about why that's so important on an organic farm later, but that from the beginning has been one of our goals. Yeah, for example, we like to be as self-sufficient as possible by growing all of our own vegetables as much as possible. Yeah. And so our goal yeah, is yeah to run healthy, peaceful, environmentally sustainable farm and lifestyle. So uh, most mostly we grow vegetables uh, self sort of su 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 sufficient. What we are doing we. You, you know, past many years we don't buy most vegetables. Yeah, it feels strange to buy vegetables mm -hmm. now because we have all our own vegetables. It's so nice. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. We often yeah to to train future farmers and share our knowledge and passion is like uh, we often host young people on our farm to teach them about how to grow organically. For example, we have trained apprentices to manage their own farm. 
we have also hosted school groups uh, and especially for that we feel really important for educate for environment for children and this picture is uh, like a uh, uh, Eva's uh, school students we invite them to study here so maybe a highlight for us is having the kids here and teaching them about um, about farming and, and just growing food. They often don't know anything about where carrots come from. So it's such a highlight for us. Okay. Um, and then our goals and our final goal in philosophy is we like to grow resilient, diverse heirloom vegetables. We'll talk more about that a little later, but basically heirloom vegetable means old, ancient uh, varieties that you don't see. So they're not common anymore around the world, uh, but they're there and their genetics um, are resilient. And I'll talk more a bit about that later as well. But um, there's many reasons to grow these old varieties of heirloom vegetables. Uh, and it's an exciting uh, change we're seeing in the market as well. Uh, we're also committed to growing organically, strictly organically, and we'll talk about why and what those practices look like. And of course, our last one is to save our own seeds. Uh, we're really committed to that and we're already up to, I think, 40 varieties or something that we save our own seed for. So, uh, and also, <laughs> can explain, also we grow only we use only heritage, heirloom seeds. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we might say heirloom or heritage, they're kind of interchangeable. So if you hear heirloom or heritage vegetables from us, it means old varieties of locally, um, um, they're like and, local old varieties. And also you, all vegetables, we can save that seed also. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. okay. So um, Kambara-sensei asked us to think about, well, how do our goals and philosophies connect with sustainable development goals that the United Nations laid out? You're probably familiar with this picture. There's 17 uh, goals by the United Nations. So what we did is we went through and we picked out the ones that connect. Um, and how they connect to our different goals. And so we'll explain a little bit about that. But to be honest, there were too many connections and we, we can't mm -hmm. talk about them all in only an hour. So we've only picked, we are highlighting a few, uh, which I think says a lot about organics. So um, what one of our big conclusions that we made during this present, during making this is that organic farming techniques mitigate climate change, which means they help reduce the effects of climate change or reverse climate change in some change, in some situations. Uh, they help build food security for communities and they support a more sustainable and regenerative approach to agriculture. And we'll revisit this at the end again, but it's been really a great experience for us to put together this presentation because we realized like we're able to support the United Nations goals and it's kind of an exciting thing to realize. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay, so the first thing we'll talk about and it is we put it first because it is the most important thing for us that we have found in our many years of farming is to nurture biodiversity in the soil which really just means building living soil. And we found three connections to the United Nations goals, um, responsible consumption and production, it mitigates climate change, and it supports life on land, as you can see in um, this, this slide. Um, and like I said, biodiversity really means a range of, of a variety of living things living in the soil. So let's uh, dive into that. Uh, for me, I'm gonna, I might get a little excited because this is such an exciting topic for us. And for me, I get so excited when I, when I share it. So um, first thing is when we started farming in Japan, we didn't know you can measure soil bacteria. And I didn't realize this was a possibility until what, 2016 mm -hmm. was when and we it became um, to our attention. Who who helped us find this? This, this is a shared lab for Japan. Mm -hmm. That company uh -huh. uh, they support. You know later on we can 
I explained for, about them too. Mm. And they, uh, they are supporting organic new farmers. And also that time they care about uh, level of the radiation in, in the soil. Oh, of yeah. the radiation mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So we'll share a bit more about Share the Love Jap for Japan. But this organization really wants like, like Zendu Sunset is they really want to support new farmers. So they found a company in Tsukuba, Ibaraki Prefecture called DGC Technology Inc. And they paid for our very first soil test in 2016 to check for the bacteria levels in the soil. And we were so excited to find out what, what is it? What does it mean? How does it work? So let me explain it to you. You can see on the picture here, there are two, um, let's see if I can get my uh, pointer going. Here we go. All right, so there are two um, tables and these individual red dots, they're called wells. So what we did was we collected 20 different samples of soil from around our garden at about 30 centimeters deep and we sent, we mixed it all together, sent it to DGC Technology in Ibaraki Prefecture, and then they created these um, these wells. I guess it would be like a petri dish if you're in a in a lab, and they could calculate the amount of active beneficial bacteria per one gram of soil. So in the 2016 sample, you can see there's quite a few red cells, which shows a active bacteria levels. And apparently we had 1.25 million active beneficial bacteria in per gram of soil at that time. The very next year we did it again and look at, it's a lot more. We had 1.5 million beneficial detectable active bacteria per one gram of soil. Um, and we thought, okay, great, that's exciting, but what does that mean? <laughs> so what? You so have this ten ten thousand? No, that's mm. one point two million. Oh, one point two million. Mm. Uh, I think the more than like uh, one million mm. is a uh, good story. It's already good. Is a good story. That's right. That's, uh, approved by the. Yeah. So yeah. we'll go to the next slide. It shows that. So this is the information chart that they sent us. And basically it says, if you have between one and 1.3 million active bacteria per gram, it already means you have great soil for producing vegetables. But we had 1.5 million. So basically we have super soil is what they said. And then we thought, okay, well, that's great. But you know, again, wh why, how is that useful knowledge and how did we get that? Well, they told us that if you have super soil, you may not even need to add compost or any nutrition. You may not need to add fertilizer, uh, calcium, ash, you may not need to add anything to the soil because what we've learned is that bacteria in soil have a relationship with roots. So this is the bacteria, this is the roots. They work together and they actually produce nutrition or they not produce, they allow the roots to access nutrition from the soil, especially carbon. Um, so you may not even need to add anything to your soil if you've got super high levels of beneficial bacteria. But what was really cool to find out is that of all that testing that we did here in this, on this slide, it's actually only 1% of the possible bacteria. So you're really only testing 1% of, of all the bacteria that's possibly there, meaning we don't know very much yet about the huge diversity of living organisms in the soil. Um, this is only a small portion of it. And even just that is so beneficial. So it's really exciting to find this out. So the next question was, well, how did we do it? <laughs> right. um, and oh yeah, they send you something. Yeah, can I explain a little yeah, bit more sure. about? Yeah. And so they com compare about soil from the conventional farmers soil and then organic farmers soil. And 
uh, of course, at conventional farmers, it's a lower level of the bacteria. And, and that meaning is uh, soil doesn't have the nutrition. Mm. So uh, it's a vegetable is not really growing very well also. Mm -hmm. that, that effect, a lot of effect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And later on, actually, I think I have a slide that talks about that bacteria mm -hmm. sequesters carbon. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it holds the carbon and allows the plants to use that carbon. Mm -hmm. So and this is only numbers of the bacteria, but the, this how to, how to uh, resort about mm -hmm. uh, this soil, soil condition. Yeah. So it says picture too, you know, we, we don't have picture no. on this one, yeah. but the picture is, uh, is uh, amazing. The, they have a, a amazing technology, take a bacteria pictures in the soil. And that picture is almost like a universe, you know, so many stars and million of stars, we cannot count that stars. And, and if you look at evening, yeah. you look at the citas, yeah, yes. So are you like saying that. there's a universe in the soil? Universe is in the soil too. Isn't that awesome? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> All right, so, um, what tell us about this picture, Sandy? Oh, okay, this uh, level, this, 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 this level is, uh, yeah, because we have a good amount of the bacteria in our soil. We approved, approved by DGC technology to use this sticker. It tells our buyers we have nutritious and excellent soil. And myself, I feel this is the most important part of organic farming. Yeah, this, but you know, that's organic farmers. Of course, many organic farmers has a good soil, but that this is for the approved for the good soil. So mm -hmm. we call it a soil mark. Mm -hmm. So we we can put this sticker on all our produce mm -hmm. now. This picture is um, they're called garlic scapes. So it's the garlic uh, flower that comes out in spring. It's kind of curly, you can see. So we can put the soil mark sticker on all of our produce now mm -hmm. because, and just to, to start educating people because people don't know mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. quality soil is really mm -hmm. important. And now we can even use it as a marketing tool yeah, mm -hmm. to market. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the question is, how did we do it? How did we get so much beneficial bacteria in our soil? Well, um, the, one of the really cool things we learned from our neighbors, actually, mm. uh, is called, what is this in Japanese again? Kuntan. Kuntan, which is biochar in English. And this is really new to us. Only in the last few years, we've really been really using it a lot. So basically, biochar is, if you look at the, the left picture here, you start with the husk, the shell on a rice. So one, each grain of rice has a shell. And when you take the shells off, um, they're considered a byproduct. And you can use them in many ways in the garden. Mm. But for biochar, we want to slowly roast them. It's like, think of it as cooking them over a long time, but not burning all the way till it's ash. So you can see in the picture here, Zendu-san um, is using what's called a biochar chimney. And you make a little fire in the bottom and you put the rice husks around the bottom, uh, a lot of them, as you can see in this picture. And over about five hours, it slowly roasts the um, rice husk until it becomes black. And, but it still has its shape. It's, but mm -hmm. it's super black. Um, what could you compare it to? Like a, like a yeah, charcoal? Yeah, if you, if you cook more, if you burn more, it becomes ash. It becomes ash. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to over overcook them or over roast it. And this, this is what the final product looks like. You can see in the picture here. This is basically roasted uh, rice husk. And I was so curious about, well, what's so good about biochar? So I found this website called the American US Biochar Initiative. And they say that biochar's immense surface area and complex pore structure 
like one gram of this can have um, an, a surface area of over 10, over a thousand square yards. That's a really huge surface area. But that surface area provides a secure habitat for microorganisms like bacteria and fungi. Fungi is like mushrooms. Certain fungi form symbiotic relationships with plant root fibers, and this allows for greater nutrient uptake by plants. I was talking earlier about the importance of working together, the roots and the bacteria and, in, and sometimes the fungi work together to allow greater nutrient uptake, meaning the plant can absorb and access more nutrition and, and basically grow tastier, healthier vegetables, right? Mm -hmm. So biochar is kind of a new, it's a bit of a new frontier in, I would say, Western culture. This is pretty new. Mm -hmm. uh, in Japan, it's been around yes. for a long time. Long time, yes. This, is, this so. technique is like, uh, uh, we learned from the, Really, really old farmer in mm -hmm. this area, and they are using for a long, long time. Yeah. And not only this is just rice husk examples, rice rice husk biochar, mm -hmm. but there's many biochar also. Yeah. No? That's yeah. uh, even wood chips. Oh yeah, wood mm -hmm. chips. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can. Um, we might experiment with wheat someday. Wheat mm -hmm. husk, what might mm -hmm. be interesting. But basically, you're just creating. You're creating surface area for bacteria to flourish and, and, and beneficial bacteria to grow and then putting it in the soil. And uh, that is going to help your roots, your plant roots to flourish. Okay, so what else do we do to improve uh, the bacteria in our soil? Yes, our main compost is called weed compost. Uh, we are making from the weed. We cut weed and and stack together with uh, nuka. Nuka is a rice brand. Brand rice brand, and make a make a fermentation faster. And that's uh, a lot of nutrition nutrition for the soil. There's many nutritions need in soil. Uh, example like. Uh, uh, what uh, nitrogen. nitrogen and phosphorus, phosphorus. Yeah. and and we the compost is from the natural material and uh, I believe this is best uh, really good uh, material for the soil. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And can I explain about uh, this technique to how to make. Sure. You know, we, we stack and we put the uh, rice bran and stack, stack, and then uh, it's become fermentation, they make heat and then become like 40 degrees, 50 degrees and become break up the, all the weeds. And finally uh, become almost like a soil, but we keep turning and make a uh, oxygen to the air. And, mm -hmm. and that's uh, we, how to make. Also, so uh, I also I'm Zen Buddhist monk and I'm cook uh, also and I make pickles too Japanese pickles and Japanese pickles is uh, full of the uh, bacteria. It's a good bacteria and really really good for the uh, body, especially good for the intestine. Almost like a yogurt. Western people eat yogurt for the good mm. for the intestine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, making compost is almost like a pickling. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, I like the comparison. I often describe the bacteria in soil as like similar to the bacteria in your gut. Like you need to have a healthy body, you need bacteria in your system. To have healthy soil, you need bacteria in your soil. And uh, Zenju san you were talking about how you're a cook, right? So. Yes. Can you talk about this one? Okay. <laughs> yeah, weed compost is very important on our farm, but also uh, compost all our kitchen waste in this box, in this box. Huh? I lost my pointer, mm -hmm. this one. We put this our one. kitchen waste kitchen in waste. here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to use only uh, vegetable material and we don't use any animal and materials, uh, which is perfect because we are vegan and we eat only uh, organic vegetable and all the compost making 
in uh, this box. <laughs> Can you explain a bit, hmm? a little bit more? Oh, um, well, just, yeah, like the kitchen scraps and all the wheat compost, we just we turn it into soil. And then the next picture explains what we do with it, of course. <laughs> you can see we add it to the soil every time we put seeds, every time we plant uh, yeah, like seedlings. A, yeah, like seedlings, you know, mm. called transplanting. It's uh, into the, this ground. Yes, every time before we plant, yeah, mm. we, we put, put uh, materials in, in the ground. Yeah, including the biochar that we mentioned earlier. You put mm. a little bit of biochar, so you can add these amendments to the soil directly. I'm gonna move along, looking at the time, okay? Mm. Move along. Another thing we do with our compost is we make compost tea, and it's not for drinking. <laughs> Don't drink compost tea. Um, but you can see, um, this is a potato bag, like a mesh, and we put the compost that look, just looks like soil in there, and then we stick it in these buckets of water, and then we can use that water, which is full of bacteria and, and wonderful nutrition, and we just water plants in the soil. Maybe some plants boost a little extra nutrition at the end of their life, so we often make compost tea as well. Mm -hmm. Also, you make uh, the worm compost. Too. Oh yeah, worm worm compost too. Yes, I have a worm composter, like a smaller a smaller one for my class <laughs> with my students. Okay, we also add other things. What do yeah, we add, we add like rice husks uh, before before the make biochar. Also, like this picture is what we cover, keep moist the soil and calciums from shellfish mm. and wood dredge and e EM liquid, which is called uh, effective microorganism, uh, mix of bacteria and yeast and fungi. And rice bran also, rice bran has a lot of uh, nitrogen and, and bug compost and uh, we in Japan we have so many like a tree. We have a lot of uh, nature's mountains trees, and then bark compost is uh, available every like a farm stores. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, like mm -hmm. uh, Conan and Komedi, you can get bark compost mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For uh, yeah. No, for no. for example, abracasu. No, I would like doesn't say abracasu here, but oh, yeah. Yeah, here, oil yeah. seed. Oil seed shells. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sometimes sesame seed, uh, byproduct of making sesame oil. So the leftover shells are full of nutrition, like nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And wood ash controls soil pH. And rice bran is also great for nitrogen. We don't use any animal uh, manures, mm -hmm. like uh, cow manures and stuff, chicken manures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We try to not use. Yeah, we've mm -hmm. moved away from using animal manures as a compost, just because we have access also to a lot of other really beneficial amendments for the mm -hmm. soil. Also, can I explain mm -hmm. about? Uh, animal manures also, uh, uh, sometimes we have to be careful too. If it's in a, in a natural, like organically growing, the, the chickens and cows, it's okay, but the most uh, farmers, conventional, the animal farmers, they use uh, chemicals mm. to feed the cows and chickens. And that's why we don't we don't use. We it's, avoid. A, it's actually really hard to find organic animal byproducts in Japan uh, just because there aren't that many organic uh, animal products uh, in Japan anyway. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, another thing we do to improve the soil uh, and thinking about bacteria is we do companion planting. So these are examples in the pictures here of companion plants. Basically a companion is like a friend. So think of it as these two plants are friends. Uh, this is a marigold flower. And of course that's a watermelon. If you plant them side by side, but really close, 
um, they help each other grow in different ways. Some companion plants produce, um, like the, the, the roots actually mix together and they help each other uh, grow bigger and stronger. But they also um, create a good space for bacteria. Um, marigold, this, in this picture, actually is a natural insecticide. Uh, insects don't like marigold, especially like aphids and like, uh, what's aphid in Nihongo? Aburamushi. Aburamushi, like they don't like marigold. Mm -hmm. So um, we plant marigold everywhere because it's a natural pest control for insects, but not bees. Bees love marigold. And it's good because bees help, of course, pollinate all of our crops. Um, but another example of um, two plants you could put together is like peas. Um, you might put peas with um, something green like kale. So peas uh, produce their own nitrogen. And of course, something green like kale needs a lot of nitrogen to grow big and strong. So you might pr uh, try planting them together and then they can help support each other. In this photo, we've got head lettuce with green onion. And of course, onion is a root crop. Lettuce is um, a leafy crop. So they're opposite families and they can help support each other and keep pests away. Or, um, and even in some cases, it just helps keep the moisture, the water in the soil. Um, and of course, fungi and bacteria need a lot of moisture to stay active and thriving. So there's a lot of reasons to grow companion plants together. And there's books and books on the topic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lots of yeah, information. Yeah, we, we're still learning about this uh, companion planting techniques. It's yeah. uh, really interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. My, I have a book called um, Carrots Love Tomatoes. Apparently, you can grow carrots right beside tomatoes that grow up. So I haven't done it yet, but mm. it sounds like a really mm. interesting match. Yeah, farming study is a <laughs> life study. <laughs> Forever learning. There's always something new to learn. <laughs> okay, um, another thing we do to keep the soil quality really, really great is, is crop planning and our crop uh, rotation. This is not a great picture, I'm sorry, but if you could look closely, these are, it's a big map of our, all of our gardens. And we map out every year what we grow, when, what we added to the soil, how long it took, the condition. So we have detailed records of every single garden bed and what we grew in it. Um, and there's a bit of a rotation that organic farmers have followed forever, that it's a good practice. You can see here, if you grow a leaf vegetable like lettuce, the next thing you grow after that should be something like a fruit, like perhaps um, peppers. Uh, and then after a fruit, you might grow a root vegetable like daikon radish. And then after that's finished, you grow a legume, which is like a beans or peas, let's say edamame. And then you go back to the rotation. So after edamame, you could grow another leaf vegetable, maybe um, arugula and, or pakichi, uh, cilantro. So it's a bit of a cycle. And the re reason we do this rotation is because each crop requires different nutrition. So here, fruit crops follow leafy greens because fruit crops need a lot of phosphorus. Root crops follow fruits because they need potassium. And then legumes follow roots because legumes make their own nitrogen, which is great for the next leafy crop after that. So if you keep, if organic farmers keep that in mind um, and have a rotation for their crops, you're not growing the same thing year after year. And this is a problem on big, large scale conventional farms, especially like in North America. Sometimes they grow, you know, corn for 10 years in a mm -hmm. row on the same land every year. And that just depletes the soil of all the nutrition that that crop needs, which, which means you have to add chemical fertilizers. Mm -hmm. You have to add mm -hmm. um, chemicals so that it will keep growing and you'll get the, to get the same amount of fruits and vegetables. But if you do a rotation, they naturally, the, the roots and the crops naturally replace some of those nutritional needs um, on their own, just by through rotation. And it keeps the soil much healthier and stronger. Mm -hmm. Do you wanna add anything or fill in the box? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Another thing we do for soil um, is green manures. Mm -hmm. So like, what are we growing here in this picture, Zendu? This is rye. Rye, mm -hmm. okay, uh -huh. that's rye. Oh, yes. here we go, rye. Yeah. yeah, yeah, technique of the green manure. We grow this one and then we cut it up really small and then into the soil. So, that helps, so. so rye is like, a, normally you would wait till the seeds grow mm -hmm. and then harvest the seeds, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, like oats, wheat, uh, and different legumes. But if you're doing a green manure, you don't wait for the crops to grow fully mature with seeds. You cut it off before that. And like Zendisan said, you turn it into the soil. Yeah, it's a young leaf has a more nutrition too. Oh, mm -hmm. like sprouts. Mm -hmm. Sprouts have mm -hmm. a lot of nutrition. Mm -hmm. So we cut it off and we mix mm -hmm. it into the soil. Mm -hmm. And then that gives the soil a mm -hmm. lot of benefits. Like it controls the weeds. It gives more nutrition. It, it's like adding humus or organic material. So like this greenhouse that you're looking at is very sandy soil. So often when you have sandy soil, you want to add some humus or organic material so that it's not so sandy. So that's what green manures are good for. Mm -hmm. uh, it also adds carbon to the soil, which all plants need to grow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whole garden kind of composting. Yeah, like mm -hmm. whole garden composting. Mm -hmm. Think of it that way. Mm -hmm. And instead of adding any fertilizers, this acts as a manure, but it's green manure instead of like regular manure. Okay. Okay. Um, one other thing we're trying more and more is no-till farming. We are not a no-till farm, but we're trying mm -hmm. it uh, mm -hmm. bed by bed. And no-till means we don't turn the soil and add more nutrition. Instead, we leave the soil and we just plant directly into whatever was there last time. And the reason we do that is to protect this word, this here, the rhizosphere. The rhizosphere is that layer under the soil where fungi and the roots of plants meet. So the rhizosphere is full of active, you know, bacteria, fungi, um, and living things. And if you are constantly turning that with a machine, a rototiller or a tractor, you're actually breaking apart all all those beneficial um, connections that are, are happening in the rhizosphere. So the philosophy of no-till farming is to leave that layer under the soil intact and you plant into it. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about this, because it is a fascinating study, <laughs> go to this podcast right here. It's called The Ruminant. Um, sorry, I can't see that. Oops. Um, go to The Ruminant. And that podcast has a whole episode number, I'm, what's in the references, the episode on microbial roots of life and health. It is excellent. And it just talks all about the, all the benefits of having that rhizosphere and the benefits of that in the soil. Okay. So what's in this picture? Yeah. So as you can see, yeah, if you, concentrate on healthy, nutritious soil, your plant will be really healthy and strong. And like this picture, you will see that the left one is soybean. This is soybean. soybean. And, yeah. then, and then the next one is uh, eggplant. It's uh, really tall and healthy, looks really healthy plant. And then right side, it's uh, this okra and red stem is uh, called red okra. And last year, somehow got really tall. It's a uh, three meter high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, we couldn't reach the okra. We had to bend the plant. Mm -hmm. They were so tall this year. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this is one of our gardens that has the super soil that we tested. And you can see just in the picture, it was so lush and green mm -hmm. this year. And it mm -hmm. did so well. It produced a lot of vegetables mm -hmm. this year. Okay. All right. So next, <laughs> we spent most of this presentation is about the soil. So the rest are just shorter bits. So thank you for your patience. That was mm -hmm. a lot about soil, but really is a priority. It's the most important part of organic farming, really. 
So um, another way uh, that we support the United Nations Sustainable Development goals is to nurture biodiversity in the garden, not just underground in the soil, but the actual garden, the plants, the animals. And by doing that, we're supporting life on land, climate action, responsible production and consumption, and, and it's reducing hunger in the world. We never spray pesticides, chemical pesticides on anything. And the main reason, obviously we're organic, so we can't, but also the problem is there's so many beneficial animals, living things in the garden that might, we might kill if you spray. And I have this word here, indiscriminately. It's a huge word, but it, it means if you spray, let's say for aphids, aburamushi, you might also be killing bees ants, dragonflies, and other beneficial insects, because some of these weed uh, pest killers kill many things at once, not just one thing. Now, some of them do uh, just control one thing at a time, like they're meant just for aburamushi, uh, uh, aphids, but many of them uh, kill many other beneficial animals, Gar what I like to call garden helpers. So here are some examples of some of the garden helpers that we protect every single day. <laughs> yeah, Imori, left one, Imori, it's a Japanese salamanders that eats slugs and bugs. And right one is a, it's a special frog called a Mori Aogairu, the forest green tree frog. It's a pro protected species in Japan. And they eat a lot of insects to protect our gardens. And we have many enemies. Garden <laughs> so enemies. Garden, garden. <laughs> <laughs> so this frog lives only near fresh water, super clean water, and lies their eggs in a tambo, it's a rice field. And so this area, rice, we, have, we have many, many rice fields, this area. And, and this area is really famous for the good rice because the water is really clean and um, really fresh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, these are really special frogs. They're protected under uh, Japanese government. So um, it's really nice to see them everywhere in the garden. And this is the ladybugs. Yeah, ladybugs is a really popular, famous for the eating, the, especially eating the abramushi aphids. And they can eat 5,000 aphids during their short life. <laughs> so we are always happy to see ladybugs in their, uh, and also the larva. La larva. This is a larva. larva. <laughs> yeah. Oh, in the garden, yeah, we sometimes we are excited to see that, see them. That. Mm -hmm. So if you see this, it doesn't look like a ladybug, but this is like the um, like the teenager, the the young adolescent version of a ladybug. If you see those ever in on trees or in your garden, don't touch them. They're really those are the assassins. <laughs> those are the ones that eat most of the abramushi, the the um, aphids. <laughs> Okay, another garden helper is, this is called a parasitic wasp. And believe it or not, even those scary wasps, some of them eat caterpillars. And a lot of people don't know that, um, they just think they're scary, but this wasp was putting that caterpillar in, um, it was, it's, it's a mud, kind of a mud house that it had laid its eggs in. And they put the caterpillar in there for the larva when they hatch to eat. So it's like pretty cool, <laughs> but we love seeing these parasitic wasps around because they really help clean up the, this is a cabbage moth uh, um, caterpillar. And of course, um, what's this called again? A praying mantis. Praying mantis, yeah. What's in Nihongo? Kamakiri. Kamakiri. They are super helpers too. They eat lots of bugs and, and insects. And then of course we have lizards, lots of frogs and um, dragonflies eat a lot. They eat their own body weight in, in uh, mosquitoes every day. <laughs> so they're really helpful as well. Um, and then- Earthworms oh, yeah. and beetles. 
Yeah. Like this uh, Kuagata uh, English called a uh, stag beetle. Stag, stag, be stag beetle. beetle. Yeah. All live in our garden in uh, build soil. But if you're spraying pesticides, insecticides, fungicides all the time, all these animals, they can't live there. And they're all helping us. So we're, we really are strong advocates to please, like, don't spray if you can avoid it. <laughs> especially our pollinators. Um, I didn't put any references, but there is a global problem right now with our po bee populations are dying around the world because of neonics. Neonics are, um, it's a, uh, basically it's a chlorine based pesticide that gets sprayed on, on plants, on crops, and it kills a lot of bees. We have a huge program. Some, some uh, like advanced countries already, like European, some European countries, that they quit. They banned, uh, they banned, they banned these but still in, in Japan, still we're using that. And then and sometimes the, some rice, rice farmers, they use that. So okay. that's why we, we, we have not enough population of the bees. bees. Even we had a beehive in our garden for two years to try and attract the bees to, to come and stay. We even put like a pheromone uh, chip to try and attract the bees. We couldn't because the neighbors still spray mm. um, some of these really harsh chemicals. So yeah, Japanese called Nikochidaido. Nikochidaido mm. is the uh, name of the pesticides. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, if you want to learn more about it, maybe we can add some more information later, but I didn't put any of that. But this is a big area of study and kind of global concern for pollinators right now. Okay, another way we support the um, biodiversity in the garden is, of course, just the plants themselves. We mentioned in the beginning that one of our goals is to grow heirloom. Uh, vegetable varieties, which means old or ancient localized vegetable varieties that maybe are unusual. Like maybe you've never seen this. Um, what's this one called? The uh, name? Koshin daikon. It's uh, in the English called watermelon. Watermelon radish. Watermelon radish. Like look at how beautiful it is. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't know about these. Um, because they're not like super popular um, yet. But I think that there's a movement happening to try and eat um, more heirloom and older varieties of vegetables. And the reasons for that is they are locally adapted, delicious, beautiful, and down here it says genetically uh, resilient. And genetic resilience really just means they, their genetics are really strong to survive in the local climate, in the local environment against pests and climate change. So here's a quote for you um, from a great article in National Geographic, which I recommend you read. Uh, By growing heirloom and other non-commercial varieties, small farms bolster biodiversity and increase food security. With only 12 plants and five animal species making up 75% of what the world eats, food systems are vulnerable to natural disasters and disease outbreak. I find that shocking that most of the world, 75% of what we eat is only 12 varieties of plants. And that's unbelievable when there are literally millions of varieties of vegetables out there that are unheard of or old or are lost or forgotten. So this is an important part of developing food security um, through organics, but also for the United Nations goals. Should I move along? Okay. Like, you wanna show this example of a heirloom variety? Yeah, this, uh, first of all, this explain this is a we do the uh, workshop for the miso, make miso workshop. And that's miso is come from made, uh, ingredients, so main ingredients of the soybean. And especially this area, famous soybean called tamba, kuro, kuro, kuro is a black soybean. And yeah. We, we make uh, miso and we try to make preserved food from the other vegetable too. And this is a really old variety. It's a heirloom variety mm -hmm. of, of uh, soybean from the Tamba area of, is that Kyoto, Tamba? Yes. So yeah, from Kyoto. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So um, the other, some of the other things we do is, uh, of course, organic. The practice of organic supports the United Nations goals on many, many fronts. So I'm just going to move along quickly here. Uh, a big area, though, is reduce greenhouse gases. Uh, I, through my doing this pr uh, presentation, I realized that we actually reduce greenhouse gases in many ways by being organic. Um, if you're not sure what greenhouse gases are, they're the, the gases responsible for climate change. So for example, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, those are all um, naturally in the environment, but um, with, with technology, the turn of the um, century when the, the industrial revolution happened, there's too many greenhouse gases now in the atmosphere causing the world to warm. And unfortunately, conventional farming is a big culprit, a big problem because over a century now of conventional farming has been releasing chemical fertilizers and pesticides or using them and chemical fertilizers and pesticides release huge amounts of greenhouse gases into the air. Not only by just using it, but by making them, it produces greenhouse gases. Um, one study in Nature Magazine, it showed that there's 40.2% um, reduction of nitrous oxide emissions per hectare of organic compared to non-organic systems. So there's a huge difference um, if you do choose organic or not. Um, another study from Yale University showed that the world's cultivated soils have lost between 50 and 70% of their original carbon stock, much of, it, much of which has oxidized upon exposure to the air um, to become carbon dioxide. So you can see in this picture um, large scale uh, conventional farms turn huge amounts of soil. They turn it every, even a couple times a year. Well, just by turning all that soil and leaving it exposed, you're releasing all of that carbon that was stored in the soil. So soil is a carbon sink. And if you're familiar with, with, with the whole concept of climate change, you'll know that like coral reefs are a carbon sink, trees are a carbon sink, like forests, and so is soil. And so it is shocking to see that up to 70% of their stock is gone now because of agriculture. So um, deep tilling, um, constantly leaving soil exposed is now, we need to change that. It can't be happening anymore. So instead of using these pesticides and chemicals and turning the soil so much, uh, we use things like floating row cover, you, you can see here, so the bugs can't attack. It's more like prevent rather than react, because of course, pesticides is usually a reaction to bugs and pests coming in. So instead, we use floating row covers. Um, our Rodale Institute had another study. This is amazing finding. Organic agriculture can remove from the air and sequester 7,000 pounds of carbon dioxide per acre per year. So that's a lot of carbon that we can put back into the soil where it belongs. Um, but this is, the, this is the potential that organics has in this fight against climate change. If you're interested in learning more about this, I highly recommend this movie. We watched it recently. It's on Netflix. It's called uh, Kiss the Ground. And it talks about regenerative agriculture, which is what I've been talking about, kind of. It's like the idea of, of using agriculture to store carbon in the soil rather than like constantly releasing it. Um, it's a sink, a carbon sink. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, it's all about deep roots and the, that rhizosphere under the soil. Mm -hmm. This was a really great mm -hmm. little, I would say it's like a good beginner's video movie, like for beginners mm -hmm. to understand this better. Mm -hmm. um, and they've got lots of famous people to get you excited about it mm -hmm. <laughs> on it as well. <laughs> yes, we are, we are really important for the organic, organic movement in this globally. Mm. Mm -hmm. Please check it out on Netflix. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, this is about seedlings. And yeah, the, it's really hard to find organic seedlings in stores. 
especially in Japan, right? maybe any countries, because uh, usually sea drinks, they use a lot of uh, chemicals to grow faster. Mm. And also pesticides too. In the beginning, they put the pesticides and bugs doesn't attack. So we grow uh, everything from the seed. Yeah, and then we make our own soil mix and start, start up the, the seedlings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we also use some um, local uh, transportation, like a network, uh, a couple networks that we use. Um, and it's really important to talk about this because they've supported the local organic movement a lot. You can see here there's On the Slope and Kyoto Organic Action. And by working with these um, food distributors and networks in our area, we're building food sovereignty. This is another, an, another buzzword in the organic movement, which really just means build local food systems that are sustainable and self-sufficient. So Japan can feed Japan. You don't necessarily need to be bringing in food from other countries. Food sovereignty is, especially with climate change, especially with the problems with global development, it's really important to grow and provide food for your, for your local area. You wanna talk about Kyoto Organic Action? Yeah, Kyoto Organic Action is uh, started about maybe five years ago, and the support organic farmers, especially for new new farmers too, and they help connect farmers and buyers by delivering locally, and they are developing Japanese organic movement too. And this another company called Sakanotochi on the slope. And this is, this two of them is uh, our, our bias, our vegetable bias too. Mm -hmm. mm. And Sakanoto is distributor for the organic vegetables. And also they are helping young, young farmers. Uh, now in Japan, uh, it's a still really low organic farmers, less than 1% and mostly commercial farmers. So uh, it's uh, maybe you know ten, ten years now. Uh, uh, from ten years ago, they started a lot of happening. In this kind of companies, new uh, younger people started, and younger younger new farmers also starting organic farm farming too. Mm -hmm. Including us. This is the company on the slope. They helped us find our farm here mm -hmm. after the Fukushima disaster. So they had a project called the Hello Farm Project, uh, which we now took the name Hello Farm Organics. Mm -hmm. And the project was to find farmers from the Tohoku area after the Fukushima disaster and move us south to, um, to sort of restart farms again. So these two organizations are really instrumental in supporting the organic movement in Japan. Mm -hmm. So we really wanted to spend a moment to tell you about mm -hmm. them. Okay, so other things we do. Mm -hmm. um, so we host lots of volunteers uh, in our gardens, as you can see. Uh, and uh, we do this for many reasons. One, education, get to uh, get uh, just to teach people about farming, but also you can't compare using your hands in the garden to a machine. Hand weeding and using your hands in the garden is always better if you because it doesn't compact the soil as much. Heavy machinery compacts the soil, redu produces lots of greenhouse gases, but humans. Uh, we just have such a, a, a softer, gentler touch in the garden. Um, and it reduces the amount of fossil fuels that we need to, to, to work the land. So it helps also mitigate climate change. Um, and we host lots of volunteers, like I said, through um, Woof Japan down here. Woofing is worldwide opportunity on organic farms and it's a global network of farms and so if you go to a different country you can volunteer on a woof farm and we are woofing hosts and it's an exchange no money exchange so in exchange for six hours of help in the garden we provide food and shelter so they can stay with us we get to meet them make new friends and share knowledge uh, in exchange for their help 
And we love having woofers. We've been hosting for like almost 10 years. And I was a woofer as a young adult as well. And it was really wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, Zen, do you want to talk about Share the Love for Japan? Yes, uh, Share the Love Japan is uh, started. Actually, that's a company in the United States. They wanted to help the situation in Japan after the Fukushima disaster. Um, so many uh, the farmers like us, the organic farmers, they moved from that area to safe place. And for the startup, they helped a lot. And also the them employee in Japan, they like to, their education for the employee to the what is organic farm, farming. And so they, they come to volunteer and to learning uh, the organic techniques and stuff. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're also helping with the movement, connecting mm -hmm. organic farmers mm -hmm. together to mm -hmm. share and learn together. Mm -hmm. And they come and help us every year, right? Yes. <laughs> Another thing we do um, is we, I mentioned we save our own seed. And again, it's to build that resilience for local climate and pests. I think we're over 40 varieties that we save now. And uh, in this photo, you can see beans, tomatoes. This is okra right here. Uh, and I love saving seed. It feels like an act of uh, resistance <laughs> against the global situation. It just feels good. It feels right. Um, and it feels safe. Like, you know, you've got your own seed for next year and it just feels really good. Mm, some countries, they, they can do it, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've mm -hmm. met woofers from like Argentina. They weren't allowed to save their own tomato seeds. Mm -hmm. Now, this was a few years ago. I don't know if that's changed, but th at the time they said they weren't allowed. They had to purchase uh, controlled, genetically modified um, seeds, tomato seeds. Seeds. We were shocked because <laughs> mm -hmm. I think isn't aren't tomatoes from South America originally? Mm -hmm. Like it's 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 wild to hear this stuff. Just some more mm -hmm. seeds that we save. This beautiful red one here. This is goya. Um, it's a bitter melon. We have tomato seeds, so we save a lot. And we also mentioned we like to train future farmers. And of course you know, sharing what you know, training for the future, food security, uh, food sovereignty is really important. Some of the woofers who've come through have become farmers. Some of, we've had apprentices. Um, you can see in the photos, actually, these are three of our apprentices that we've had over the years. Um, and uh, uh, Chie-san here, she is now farming uh, her own farm in Kyoto as well. Mm -hmm. And um, so it, of course, if we connect it to the United Nations goals, that's going to support the zero hunger, well-being, and sustainable cities and communities. All right. Um, and then finally, this is our, our last uh, connection to the United Nations goals, is about food waste. It is a pet peeve. It's a really big problem for us uh, about how much waste there is in the world with food. Um, this was an amazing article in National Geographic about food waste, and it said that according to the, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, we squander or waste enough food globally, 2.9 trillion pounds a year, which is a third of the planet's food production. We waste a third of the food produced globally every year that could feed any, all the rest of the humans that are suffering and don't have food right now, easily, twice over it could feed them. So um, we have worked very hard to have no food waste. You can see in the pictures, we have some funny shaped carrots with legs or daikon radish with legs, but they're delicious, they're nutritious. They just may not be the most beautiful vegetable <laughs> you've ever seen. But Zendu-san is really good at finding buyers. And also we use a lot too. Yeah, <laughs> actually only good shape vegetable we sell and then all but shape vegetables we eat. 
Yeah. <laughs> but um, we do have some restaurants like juicer, juicing restaurants mm -hmm. that will mm -hmm. buy B, we call mm -hmm. them perfectly imperfect or mm -hmm. B grade vegetables mm -hmm. because there's nothing wrong with them. They just happen to look a little funny. The standards are out of control mm -hmm. around the world. That's the whole world program. Yeah. You know, every, everybody look, look good one, look nice one. People want it. Right? They want perfect. Yeah, yeah. All the same shaped apples. So, but... so we call what we call this one? Perfectly <laughs> imperfect. <laughs> um, and it, so, yeah, please read it if you're interested in reading more about that. There's a great article there. So, um, back to what we originally concluded about being organic farmers. Um, is basically small scale organic farms help mitigate climate change. They build food security for communities and they support a more sustainable regenerative approach to agriculture. Um, and it's really, it feels good to be a part of that but it also means we have to educate consumers. We have to train more farmers uh, because it, this organic farming is part of the solution for climate change, is part of sustainable development. Um, and we feel really passionate about that. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, um, and of course this sustainable regenerative approach, it really does, it's all about like sequestering the carbon in the soil as a carbon sink. So that's a huge impact for climate change. Well, we have a lot of references which have hyperlinks. Um, when we share this file, uh, this presentation as a PDF, you'll be able to go through and see these references and, and do further reading yourself. Um, so at this moment, I think what we'll do is um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and go back to some of the questions that I've seen down there. So let's see, how do I get out? Mm -hmm. Just a moment, if I can get out of here. Exit. Kambara Sensei, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> oh, here we go. Stop sharing, found it. <laughs> okay. So um, I see we're okay for time. We can we have some time to answer some of the questions in the chat room, but mm -hmm. I'd like to open it up to our attendees. If you have more questions, uh, please type it in the chat, not the question and answer the Q and A box, but the chat box. Okay. Um, let's see here. Let's see the first. Question. I'd like to make a suggestion. Um, yes, please. When people are asking questions in chat, uh, there's a little drop down box on your chat that says two. Uh, please select all panelists and attendees. That way, every all of the participants can see your questions, not just the panelists. Yes, that's a great suggestion. So in the chat box, make sure that it's panelists and attendees can see. Okay, um, how do you control pests and diseases? Do you buy vegetable seeds? Okay, so we did talk um, already quite a bit about how we do protect, uh, we control pests and diseases. Uh, the row covers that I, you could see um, was a big help. Uh, we, of course, if you keep healthy soil, then if you build healthy soil, that actually naturally acts as a pest control and a disease control. Um, the crop rotation we talked about is also really important for disease control. Um, so if you plant, for example, um, like we had uh, abramuji aphids uh, problem in uh, one of our beds this year. So if you kept growing the same, which was baby salad mix, if we keep growing that year after year after year, it's the, the abramuji aren't going to go away. They'll just keep staying there. Um, so the Crop rotation is a very important component of disease management. Um, and then the seeds that we save. Uh, if you are saving your own seed from the healthiest, strongest, no disease-free plants, they will have the genetic potential to, to fight off disease on their own. So saving seed is really important as well. 
And then he asked, uh, this is Tako Inamori-san. He asked, do you buy vegetable seeds? Yes, sometimes we do because we don't save all of our own seed, right? Yes, but we, we buy only heritage a seed. Heirloom heritage Her or yeah. organic seed organic as well, seed. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, we do sometimes, uh, for example, like squash is really hard to save your own seed because the different squash plants and even cucumber will cross pollinate and they'll produce some strange hybrid <laughs> that you can't eat. Yeah, if we're gonna, we're gonna save all the seed, we need a huge kind of land. Yeah, yeah. you have to have Everybody. a lot of space between mm -hmm. the crops mm -hmm. to, to save. But some seeds are really easy to save, mm -hmm. like tomatoes. You can grow two different kinds of tomatoes side by side and still save the seed from both plants. Also, all, all the kind of the beans. Oh yeah, beans yeah. are easy. Mm -hmm. Just just let it dry on the plant. Mm -hmm. You can do that. Okay. Um, uh, okay, uh, Aoki-san here. Um, I am living in an apartment and I am wondering that our tr uh, trash and peels uh, and uh, vegetables. Oh, I, I think the question is about what to do with your kitchen kitchen waste kitchen in your waste. apartment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, good question actually, mm -hmm. <laughs> because if you don't have um, a property to compost, it's really hard. Uh, but actually you can do composting in your house with uh, worms, <laughs> if you don't mind having worms in your house. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there's a, a, a small red worms called red wigglers. You can order them online and you just create like a, you can use a Rubbermaid or a Tupperware and put them in there and put kitchen scraps and they will eat the compost and make it into soil. So that's one option mm -hmm. <laughs> you can do. <laughs> but maybe you need a bigger one. Yeah, bigger box. a bigger box. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a too bad in Japan, it's still not the, the trash system. It's uh, not separated, compost and trash mm -hmm. and stuff. Uh, like Canada, America, they separate the compost beans and mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, and someday I hope in Japan gonna have happening like that. Yeah, because a lot of people live in apartments and you can't compost mm -hmm. in your apartment. Mm -hmm. So it'd be great. You know, you could write letters to your government officials, everyone say we need curbside mm -hmm. composting for everybody in the cities. <laughs> okay. Um, I found the compost for the person who live alone. So I will do that. Oh, good. So this person, uh, Aoki san said that they found out about composting alone. So that's great. Um, Another person, uh, Hina S says, can bacteria survive in water? Yes, bacteria can survive in water. Um, and it says here, is it allowed to label organic if a farmer inputs the products of compost, including non-organic veggies? Okay, so that's two different questions. Bacteria can live in, in water for sure. In fact, you've probably heard of like people um, getting like, uh, if you drink uh, water that has bacteria, bad bacteria in it, you can get really sick actually, if it's a bad bacteria. Um, so, but if you make like the, the compost tea I was talking about, that's a beneficial bacteria you can then put in your garden. Okay. Do you know that drink, the North American famous Oh, drink? kombucha. Kombucha, that's kombucha. a mushroom, the bacteria <laughs> drink. Yeah. That's a good bacteria yeah. for your body. Um, and then, okay, the question was, if you put non-organic things in your compost, can you still call it organic? Actually, no, you can't. So that's why we are not a certified organic farm. We're not certified because actually our fields are too close to the neighbors and they spray. And sometimes the spray comes over into our fields. And it's a, it's a harsh reality for farms in Japan, especially because spraying chemical pesticides is very common. We have rice fields right beside our hatake, our vegetable garden. So we couldn't be certified organic even if we tried. Mm, mm. Also that uh, in Japan, the small scale farmers, it's really difficult to get this uh, certified uh, system. It's a, it's a JA, it's a Japan, Japan agriculture. They control everything, those kind of stuff. 
So uh, all my friends too, we don't, uh, they don't have that certified small farmers. Mm. It's a lot of money and every year they have to pay a lot of money for the check the soil and stuff. Mm. And then, but fortunately in Japan, we, we trust each other, in Japanese culture. So uh, not too many people lies about, oh, this is, uh, we don't use any pesticides. This is all organically growing and not too many people doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I would say the movement is um, about 10 years behind North America. Mm -hmm. Like in North America, if you stay organic, you have to be certified or you can get charged. Mm -hmm. like by the police mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. um you you if you like our i don't think we'll be able to call ourselves hello farm organics mm -hmm. when we move to canada because we're we unless we're certified organic so to answer the question if you use non-organic materials on an organic farm you can't be certified organic so it's not technically organic. also i don't want against about organic like a uh, label organic certified organic uh, but reality is uh, in japan the standard organic the standard level is a uh, is a really like a uh, not like a North American standard. Mm -hmm. Example, like a seed, uh, uh, in Japan, you can even, you can use not, not like a heirloom her heritage seed and even um, uh, not organic seed. Yeah, and then seed, even the seed rings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, so the standards are a little more relaxed mm -hmm. in Japan. Um, in fact, uh, we sometimes get seeds that are coated with like a purple fungicide. A fungicide is to keep the fungus and mushrooms and um, uh, like, um, what's the word, uh, mold from growing on the seed because it's so humid in Japan that the seeds would die really fast if the, when the package is opened. So even organic products in Japan can sometimes like the standards are more relaxed because mm -hmm. it's just a different mm -hmm. situation. It's a different, you know, system in mm -hmm. Japan. So I put the, ourselves, we put the label, uh, not only the soil mark, that's I uh, explain, we grow everything from the seed and we don't use any pesticides and we don't use any uh, fertilizer, chemical fertilizer. I just explain on my, uh, based upon. On our labels. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's see another question. As for the management, is it full time farming or part time farming? Can mm. I answer that? Yes, I'm. Uh, yeah, that's uh, full time. <laughs> full time farming. Zenji sounds full time. I have been part time for many years because I was teaching as well. Uh, but we've always had one or two volunteer woofers. The world, the woofers are the volunteers we were talking about. So they kind of made up for when I'm not here. <laughs> so really, our farm needs about two full time people mm -hmm. constantly mm -hmm. to to maintain mm -hmm. um, our our garden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially summertime is really really busy and it's hard work. Uh, Maybe between, I would say between uh, May to uh, November, mm -hmm. but winter time is a little bit slow down. And especially this weather, we have a lot of snow outside and we cannot walk in outside. We have only greenhouse. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, we have a lot of snow here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, um, Aliana Morales is asking, um, can these practices be applied in other areas of Japan? or even in other countries, locations, and temperatures? Are the requirements the same? Um, I, think, I think she wrote that during the soil component, the soil part, when I was explaining about bacteria in the soil. And the answer is yes. These are universal concepts that you can do anywhere in the world. The big challenge is if you're in a very hot, hot desert kind of place, uh, the soil can be so dry that bacteria doesn't really grow as well as in a wet place like Japan. So you have to think about how to protect the water in the soil. And what you can do is put a lot of, um, it's called mulch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mulch is like to cover the soil with protection. It could be weeds, leaves, 
straw, even plastic. Some people use plastic mm -hmm. uh, or just let things constantly grow in the soil. Never rip everything out, like have things growing because the more you have roots and things in the soil, the more water it will hold and then the better the bacteria and the fungi will survive so um yes all the concepts we talked about are universal you mm -hmm. can do them in any country mm -hmm. in any place mm -hmm. but if it's hokkaido then of course the winter is a little harder to grow mm -hmm. <laughs> and grow mm -hmm. things but you can during the summer of course it's the same concept mm -hmm. um how big are your gardens where you grow vegetables yeah. How many tumble do we have? We have like a fifth, no, 30 meter, 30 meter square. 30 by 30 meters. Yeah, about uh, 100 square feet, right? No, no, no. <laughs> Nine, 900, 900 square, square feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we have a two of them, maybe. Two of those. But two. if it were like Japanese size tumble. Tumble, yeah, oh. tan, we call it ittan. 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 Yeah, itan, nitan, and we have about nitan, two tan. So like two yeah. rice fields, about two rice fields, which are so, quite big. So one rice field is about 30 meter by 30 meter. Yeah, but we also so, have yeah. greenhouses. We also have mm -hmm. another small garden. Yeah, but, wow. but, but, but we kind of reduced. Yeah. yeah, but I would say all together, mm -hmm. it's like just over an acre, if you're talking acres in North American standard sizes. <laughs> but we actually have many little gardens everywhere, so it's hard to say exactly the mm -hmm. exact size. <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, um, you mentioned that you host trips and educate people and children and also have apprentices to manage farms. Can you elaborate further? How do you do this? Do you have connections with universities who share the same kind of vision? Um, no, we don't have connections with universities, mm -hmm. <laughs> except now Okayama mm -hmm. University. <laughs> um, but um, the apprentices, basically, um, sometimes the woofers are the volunteers will ask to come back and be our apprentice. Mm -hmm. And we've hosted several apprentices that way. Other apprentices were local people like Chie San. Um, she is a local woman who wanted to learn the local climate and how to grow locally. Um, and they don't manage the farm for us. We, we're the managers. Mm -hmm. Actually, Zendi is the main manager. Uh, but they help us and in exchange for knowledge. So our apprentices might come for like one day a week or a couple days a week uh, or just a month we might come for a couple months. And just in exchange for their help, we teach them everything we know as much as we can in that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, now, when I was an apprentice, because I apprenticed for three years in Canada on three different farms, I was able to make a little bit of money um, because I wasn't volunteering. I was a farm paid helper, but it was for six months. So it was like a full like employment. And um, I was paid. It was a very small amount, but they provided me with a place to stay and food from the garden and a little bit of a salary to just help me because I would go back to university in between my apprenticeship. Some, some uh, organic farm in Japan also does those kind of yeah. system too. So each, each, each uh, organic farm has farms so different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've never had a full season apprentice, like whole, like every day. Mm -hmm. um, but the local, mm -hmm. the local woman, Chie-san, who was apprenticing with us, she would come once a week for the whole day, every week. So that was a, another way to do it. So you just be creative with it. Depends what people want out of the experience, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, where can we bring from soiled for compost for the living alone and at all? Oh, we already answered that, the apartment thing. Okay. Um, but how big is that? Uh, regarding my question about the size of the garden, how big is a lot that can be used for the kinds of vegetables that you grow? Well, if, you know, even one Japanese hatake, tambo, is quite big, like that's a lot to manage for one person. Uh, but you can grow a lot of food, even in just like, you know, five meters by 10 meters, you can grow a lot of food in a small area. But for business, you want at least a couple, a couple rice field, a tambo, yeah? 
Yeah, at least in Japan, we call it at least uh, per person is uh, needs uh, five tons. Five tons? You know, five tons. Which is rice fields. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Five rice field size. To make? To, to make as a, to live, to make business. Make business. Uh -huh. But we have a but, lot less than that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we, we, we do that. We have a really good soil and we do the special techniques, you know, like mm. the company and stuff. So, uh, mm. so that's a that's a book you chose that small scale. Small, oh yes, yeah. small scale organic mm -hmm. farms. Mm -hmm. Well, I I guess mm -hmm. we do intensive gardening. So like one bed is never empty. Every single hole in like a space is used growing something. So we're growing on a smaller scale, but it's more intensive. Mm. There's no wasted space ever. Whereas if you're growing on like a larger scale, you might have like a few beds that are empty for a while or uh, even one whole field that's kind of like laying there doing nothing. Mm. We don't have that. It's mm. one crop finishes and we put the next one in. Or we put three things together. Like we might have basil growing under the tomato plants. So we, that's mm -hmm. the companion plant, uh, plants I was telling you about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's really intensive farming. Mm -hmm. And we're not rich. We're not making tons of money. Yeah. And also <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't use a tractor. That's a huge difference too. Yeah. yeah. For maintain, maintain the, the garden. It's a lot of things we have to take care and many farmers are uh, using big tractors, but uh, we're thinking about that uh, uh, gas. And gas stuff. and also compacting the soil. Mm -hmm. If you drive on the soil a lot, it really compacts the soil and it's not good for soil health. So we actually try to avoid using a tractor at all, always mm -hmm. in our garden. Um, but like I was saying, we, we make enough money to survive, but we're, we're not making a lot, ton of money. <laughs> it's not our goal. As you saw, it's not our goal. The main purpose is self-sufficient. Self-sufficient. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Do neighbors, neighboring farmers accept the organic farming? I'm wondering if they complain sometimes, like the pests come from your field. Yeah, good question, actually. Mm. Really good. <clears throat> Do they complain, Zendu? Do mm. neighbors complain about mm. us? No, maybe opposite. <laughs> <laughs> we complain about them. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah, if you uh, if you looks good, if you're taking care very well, yeah, never, never complain about those kind of stuff. But if you just leave the weed grow high and stuff, Never will complain. Mm. Mm -hmm. Just uh, important <clears throat> is taking care of the garden, own garden. Mm. And no one complains that. I suppose if you allowed a uh, pest to get out of control, like um, some bugs, like let's say abramushi, if you allowed the, the uh, bugs to get out of control and didn't try to manage it organically, maybe they would complain because yeah, they would spread to the next field. But we grow really intensively and we're managing that as best that we can. And the neighbors can see that. They see that, you know, we work really hard and it's, it's not just letting it go and not taking uh, care. Yeah, I, I, I feel that everybody appreciates for the growing organically, we don't we don't do any polluted pollution to the to the rivers. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. I would say mm -hmm. for the most part, they mm -hmm. actually appreciate that we're taking care of the land, not polluting. Polluting yeah. to the and yeah. it's healthy. So, we, yeah, the one 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 things like uh, the commercial farmers, uh, you cannot see, but it's a lot of. Uh, pesticides in, in the ground and also chemical fertilizer in the ground. And finally that's merited uh, going to the river. Yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, going to river and going to ocean and those all the pollutions finally come, to, come back to your land too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and yeah, actually, um, I, I, yeah, the neighbors always seem pleased <laughs> that we're growing organic and we share lots of vegetables with them. We do exchange. So if you build your relationships with your neighbors, uh, you shouldn't have a problem, you know. <laughs> okay, next question. Um, does organic farming practice differ depending on the scale or of the farm? 
like can we apply the same practice in Japan and in Australia? Yeah, good question. Mm -hmm. Good question. I mean, it will it will change depending on the scale. Uh, you saw in one of the pictures we have uh, these like covers on the rows. It's called floating row cover, and that protects the plants from the bugs coming in. Well, I suppose if you're growing five acres of of cabbage, it's going to be really hard to cover all five acres with uh, these row covers. Uh, but then you have to ask yourself, how are you going to manage those pests? Like how organically, because you can't spray pest, pesticides. Um, so then there's a question about scale. So you, if you can grow more intensely, then you can cover all of them and get a better yield. Um, so some of the techniques are transferable to large, larger scale organics, but some are not. And I want to mention, I think there's this misconception that if you're farming, growing food, you don't want to have any bugs, no pests, don't lose any crops to, to, to nature. But actually, if we change our mentality and we think, well, okay, I'm going to lose about 10% or 20% to nature this year. Then it's okay if you lose some of your cabbages to some, some rabbits <laughs> or to uh, the cabbage moth. It's okay because we have this mentality in farming that we can't lose any of the crops, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have to save it all. Yeah, but impossible. <laughs> but it's actually impossible. And that's driving the pesticide use. It's driving that. But actually we live in harmony with nature. Like I said, one of our goals is to live in harmony with nature. So, you know, this year we had a um, mogura. What's mogura in English again? Uh, it's a mole. A mole, you know, little little moles. They're like like a mouse, but they they're um, they have a different a different mouth and they the these moles were getting in and they ate all the roots of our our uh, napa cabbage mm. <laughs> one day every day a new napa cabbage would fall over <laughs> one every day mm. but we realize the mogura lives here the mole lives here so we will try and save that napa cabbage sell it if we can or make pickles and try and keep the mogura out but we're not going to go in and spray and kill all the mogura all the all these pets these these animals because they live there too. Mm. So it's a change in mentality a little mm. bit about how you, what's more important that you make tons of money or that you live a healthy and like sustainable, uh, environmentally friendly life. So I guess, yeah, <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> we yeah, lose we, every yeah, year. Yeah, we have uh, also animal, many animals. We are quite wild area we live in here. So we have deers and wild boars. Oh, inoshishi, yeah. boars. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. <laughs> Every year they attack our garden. We do something, but uh, yeah. sometimes we feel okay. <laughs> we have to like accept that. And that's another reason to grow a good variety. Many, many, many different things. Because if you do lose one bed of carrots, well, you probably have another bed of carrots in a different location or, or maybe different root crops like potatoes that do very well. Um, so you, you try and have a good variety, a biodiversity of, of vegetables, and then you'll always have something to sell um, and to, yeah, to eat <laughs> as well. <laughs> um, okay. So the question about applying the same practices in Japan and other countries, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Do you use small agricultural machinery such as a weeding machine or hand tractor or only sickle and hull? Yeah, hand tractor. Yes. <laughs> tira, tira. Rototiller. Roto -tira. Yeah. We have a small one. That's the biggest machine we have. And of course, we, we have the weed worker, mm. weed trimmer. How do you say rototiller in Nihongo? Kanriki. 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 So it turns the soil. Uh, but again, even with that, we try to use it as little as possible because we want to keep the soil structure in, in health, uh, in good, good structure. Um, but yeah, that's the biggest tool, biggest machine mm -hmm. we have, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. 
the weed whackers, you know, cut the weeds. We have a lawn mower mm -hmm. as well to cut, to cut mm -hmm. the weeds as well. But yeah, everything else is by hand and like hoe, tool, hand tools. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard work, that's for sure. <laughs> um, then I see one more question here. My question is more specific about farming oats because I saw in the presentation, I have been re researching the growing of oats in Japan. How are you able to grow oats? Mm. Yeah, good yes. question. Yeah, actually, my friend grow this area too. Oh yeah? Yes. In Kehoku? In, in Kehoku. Kyoto? I think everywhere you can grow oats. Uh-huh. So mm. the yeah, you Wheat can. Oats. I didn't mm. know you could. Actually, this is also pe some people use as a green manure. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So oats are great as a green manure. You let it grow not to full maturity, just like a certain height, and then you chop it up and turn it into the soil and it adds carbon and, and humus to the soil. Uh, but apparently you can also grow the grain, right? Mm -hmm. to, to harvest too. the grain. Yes. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's, I think, all the questions. Did I miss any questions, Judy or uh, Kambara-sensei? Did you see? I think I got them all. Yeah, I think that's all. Thank you very much, uh, Eva-san mm -hmm. and Zenryu-san. Uh, we are very happy to have you here uh, this for this uh, special program. <laughs> and uh, 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 your speech was very wonderful and informative. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you're you. very welcome. <laughs> uh, does anybody have the, any question? Any further questions? You can type it into the chat box. Go ahead, can you? Yeah. They can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, Judy or Kambara Sensei, do you have any further questions that we can clarify that maybe was unclear as we were speaking? Um, nothing that was unclear. Um, I do have a question that I didn't write in the chat box. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, uh, you have a lot, usually have a lot of volunteers, woofers, um, and apprentices. And I was wondering how how the COVID nineteen pandemic has affected that, and um, how is it? I can imagine it probably has, and how much has that increased your workload on the farm this year? <laughs> That's a really good question. <laughs> you want to answer? Yeah, no, no, please. <laughs> well, actually. Um, because I had been teaching up until last September or last June and my contract finished, uh, we were supposed to actually move to Canada and last June, but because of coronavirus, we decided to stay another full growing season. So actually I've been farming full-time with Zenju-san. So the two of us full-time has meant we haven't needed any other helpers at this moment. But also the borders shut down for a while. So there were no other helpers or volunteers able to come from outside the country. Now there were some local people who want, who s expressed some interest, but we, um, we shut, uh, we just, we weren't really comfortable with like the physical distancing and everything to have other volunteers here when we could manage ourselves. So we haven't had any help since last June or before that, maybe mm. since last June. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Last whole whole last year, we didn't have the help us. Yeah. Mm. So Even just... apprentice, we don't we don't accept it. So uh, mm. yes, we had really hard time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's been hard. Mm -hmm. Not only with the help, but coronavirus has affected everybody in different ways. And for farming. Um, like restaurants had to shut down for a while or just people aren't going to restaurants as much. So our buyers are actually not buying as much. Well, some of them are not buying as much mm -hmm. as they used to. That decrease actually, actually decreased a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we've lost some sales that way, mm -hmm. uh, definitely. Um, but also um, because we hadn't anticipated being here, we were late starting our farm this year because we thought we were leaving Japan last June. So we were last minute seeding <laughs> for the summer vegetables. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it affected us that way too. We mm -hmm. lost some income with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I see another question here. 
from uh, Minami Aoki san. Do you know your woofer do after returning to their countries? Yeah, um, sometimes the woofers will email us and let us know what's happening. And we've had several start their own farms. Uh, some, we've got a woman in Malaysia who works in the organic food like industry. Mm. She works for a distributor now. And from that, do you remember that from Portuguese, the couple? Oh yeah, yeah the Portuguese mm -hmm. couple, they started their own mm -hmm. farm mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, and another another guy from Portugal, he, he has a goat farm or something now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he's also farming. Mm -hmm. And a couple of our woofers have come back to learn more mm -hmm. about what's happening. Um, like one of them from France, uh, Tim, mm -hmm. he now runs, um, it's a, a micro brewery, like a bar, but he, because of his time with us, he tries to source organic, uh, locally produced uh, beers from around France. So what a cool way to influence local economies, local, um, you know, industries. Uh, but definitely we've had some start farms and we share knowledge all the time. We're mm -hmm. constantly back and forth. Yeah, we have many UFAs. How many UFAs we had uh, in the past 10 years? Probably 100. Uh, yeah, probably 100 UFAs mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yes, we have a really good, many, many good stories with UFAs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a great way to exchange knowledge and, and lots from Japan too, lots of Japanese UFAs. So mm -hmm. if, uh, you know, you never know if we're still here next summer and you want to come whooping <laughs> and let us know, <laughs> you can come yeah. help us. Still we have a difficult situation, yeah. COVID-19. Yeah. Um, there are more questions. Too, uh, too. Yes, after, after. Junko Obayashi-san. Um, oh, no, sorry. Mm, yeah, okay. Can we ask for contact information? How can we reach con contact people in the farm? I assume you mean us. It's in the references at the end of this uh, slideshow. Uh, we are called Hello Farm Organics. Here, I'll just type it in here. You can see our email, our website is called hellofarmorganics.com. Uh, and we are also on Facebook at the same name, Hello Farm Organics. And our email is um, hello farm organics at gmail.com. Super easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Another question was I wonder if or how you are influencing your neighbor farmers in the, in the ways of organic farming. Actually, I think mm -hmm. we are influencing mm -hmm. the neighbors mm -hmm. <laughs> a little mm -hmm. bit. Yeah. Sometimes we don't know, but I, do you remember, do you want to put the collars? Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Some neighbors, mm -hmm. should I mention that? Yes, please. So um, there is a, a small caterpillar called Yoto, Yoto which is or a nekiri, that's a cutworm. Cutworm. Mm -hmm. They live in the soil and they will, like, let's say this is your tomato plant. They come up and they chew right through the stem and the whole plant dies. Like it's awful. <laughs> There's such a problem, these um, yotomushi. So one way to protect your plant um, is to create a collar. So you create like this and then you plant like it's too big. <laughs> it's okay. You put the plant we protect it with a collar all the way around like this. And we use, we literally use paper, newspaper like this. We put our plants in like that. And we put the soil up to here. So soil up to here, your plants sticking out and the yotomushi can't climb up somehow. They can't climb up this side of, it's called a collar. And we started doing that years ago, I think one of our first years mm -hmm. here. To, so all of our seedlings go around, we put collars on them with, with newspaper. And we started seeing it in some of the neighbor's gardens <laughs> a few years after that. So they were asking, Nenikore, like, what are you doing? Why are you putting those things around your plants? And we said, well, we don't want to spray for yotomushi, so we're using organic materials or like decompose, it can decompose and natural materials and it works. 
once the plant gets really big and strong, the stem is too thick and the yoto can't chew it anymore. And then the color just disappears because it's newspaper and newspaper can decompose. So we started seeing our neighbors using the same technique. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of nice. It felt good, like, oh, yay, they're not spraying as much now. Yeah, this uh, <laughs> neighbors is mostly the like a uh, house uh, growing for the for the for the house members. So small, small kind of gardens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, also they, they don't, they don't want to use a pesticide for themselves. Mm. So, so they like to know those kind of technique too, probably. <laughs> also, we grow all our own seedlings from seed, all our, uh, from seed. And we sometimes have extra mm -hmm. and they all love to get our seedlings. So we give them as presents. We're like, here's five extra tomatoes or some extra zucchini or some extra, you know, eggplant. And they're so happy to get our vegetables. <laughs> Um, any other way we influence? Yeah, those, I think there's other ways we influence them, I'm sure, uh, but we don't always know <laughs> about it. Um, okay, I, are there any other questions? I see that was good. We got a couple extra there. If you have any other questions, please type them in. Well, it's been an hour and 50 minutes. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you for sitting so long, everybody. <laughs> Kambara Sensei, thank you for uh, hosting us. And we feel mm. really privileged and honored that you asked us to do this. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, thank you very much for your wonderful speech. Um, yeah, so as, as you told, told us now, yeah, we already spent uh, one hour and 50 minutes. So. It's about time to close this session uh, again. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Eva-san and Zenyu-san. Uh, so You're very welcome. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, for, for participants, uh, we will upload the video of today's uh, uh, program and also uh, speaking about the slides, uh, we also uh, upload the uh, PDF uh, sometime soon. Uh, so, uh, mm -hmm. stay tuned. Uh, okay. Sounds good. <laughs> Arigatou gozaimashita. Judy-san too. Thank you, mm -hmm. Judy-san. Kamara-sensei, arigatou gozaimashita. <laughs> so, uh, it's time to close. Uh, have, a, have a nice evening, everybody. And see you yeah. soon again. Bye. Okay. Thanks to everybody. Bye-bye. Stay safe, everyone. Be organic. Organic. <laughs> <laughs> Be safe.